Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? And Callie. Again. Yeah. <laughs> this is becoming a thing. Yes. Um, all right. Well, we want to just kind of jump right into it? or Yeah, we can. So I think the first thing we wanted to talk about was the the UPS guy that was shot in in Miami. Um, dude, that, so that deal was, I don't know if anybody has seen the video or whatnot from it, but as the story goes, what happened is these two guys came in to rob a jewelry store and when they la- when they went to, I say leave, um, they were, I guess they had a, U- uh, a U-Haul truck that they had rented or something or well, something happened and they ended up like hijacking a UPS truck and, they had a high speed chase. They went like twenty six miles, I believe. And um um yeah, the police which the whole way I mean this deal was crazy, so like it was like a shootout the whole way. Like the guys in the UPS truck were like shooting at the cops and whatnot. But once they hit the traffic jam, they um they basically the police got out of their cars, hid behind like other civilian cars and whatnot with like people in them and whatnot. And basically just unloaded on this truck. And and in the end they ended up killing the two hijackers, the UPS guy and a bystander. Yeah, I would Before consider was, the UPS guy a bystander actually too. But, well no, that's what I mean. He is a bystander. Oh, absolutely. There's no question. Yeah, it was like seventy year old man coming home from work or something like yeah, that. He man. was in the the thing I saw, I think he was he was actually trying to like leave the scene or whatever and just got hit by a by a stray bullet. Yeah. Which when you say I mean it, it, honestly, I'm surprised they didn't hit as many innocent bystanders. I'm surprised they didn't hit more people. Yeah. Because, I mean, they they got, they just... And I get the frustration of, you know, this guy had been driving down the road shooting at them the whole way. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I get being irritated. Well, there's but a couple you, of things on that, though. To, but you have to, like, take it... Take root of the situation. I mean, the, the idea is, is to protect civilians, not mm-hmm. use them as... Shields, shields and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Human shields, seriously. Um, I mean, yeah, I saw the video to. Uh, there's so many things wrong with it that I don't. I don't even really know where to begin. And I talked. So my dad spent 30 years in law enforcement, and I talked to him a little bit about it today. Yeah, um, I'd be curious to know what he thought. Well, he he thought it was excessive. <laughs> Certainly. So they, he did agree they it fired, was excessive. They fired over 200 rounds, like 19 officers or something like that fired their weapons, and they, they fired over 200 rounds um, into this UPS truck. Uh, I saw a video also, um, as they were moving the truck, I guess, yeah. somebody had uh, had seen it, pulled up beside it with their cell phone. and did, Oh, no, like, I saw that. Video. I saw some videos where they were, um, well, I guess they had it on the uh, the truck hauler or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And like on it's just, it's come, yeah, it's on the flatbed and it's like coming by to just like doused in bullet holes. Like yeah. what, and at the time, not everybody knew, I guess whoever had um, posted the video I watched didn't know, was just like, what happened to this UPS truck? Like they, they hadn't heard about the shooting or whatever. It was like, what happened here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was covered in holes. And yeah. There's a few things about that. Like, the guys were in specific places. They were all in the front. Yeah. I mean, there were bullet holes all the way to the back of that truck. Yeah. Down the side. Like, that's some pretty terrible shooting, first off. Right. <laughs> um, Secondly, well, the other thing, okay, so Dad said that he thought it was excessive. Yeah. Um, but he said you, you also got to understand that once the bullets start going... The bullets start going. The tendency is to start pulling the trigger. Yeah. Um, and but these like, guys, I get these that guys too. are still trained, though. I mean, they should. Yeah, at least they're supposed. To. I mean, Broward County has not made its <laughs> reputation. Well, well, that's there's a reason I I dropped that in there is because yeah. you, we know the reputation of this county. Um, but it wasn't all Broward County, though. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys were from, I guess, Miami, where it had happened, and they ended up in Broward County. So I'm yeah. sure some of them were Broward guys. But. Yeah. So it went from Dade County to Broward County. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, they, they haven't really released any additional information at this point. Uh, I saw that the, the father of the UPS truck driver um, had 
uh, openly accused the police of murdering his son. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, and some of that you kind of chalk up to, well, that was this kid and all. But, I mean, I don't disagree with the guy. Yeah. I, well, they'll do their investigation, and we may or may not ever find out, well, actually, who's another, responsible. Another but, interesting tidbit is the FBI is, is the one doing the investigation right now. Which is kind of strange because both of the perps were killed, so there's no, there's not going to be any charges pressed against those guys, right? Um, so that was just some of the stuff I was reading, and and there's also some questions whether or not the FBI had been following these guys before they got to the jury store mm. and done all of that, and there's there's just questions there. They, the FBI hasn't said or confirmed anything, but yeah. there's some suspicion that that may be the case. So. Sorry, everyone, if you can hear that. I'm trying to slide the microphone a little closer to Gary because he can't speak up. I'm speaking up fine. I, I've given him the symbol, but maybe he just thought I was saying, good job. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I think there's – the main thing is um, that it shouldn't have come to this situation. Yeah. Right? Like uh, the – all right. Used to listen to Jason Stapleton a lot. Absolutely. Um, I don't anymore. But um, I, one thing that that sticks out to me because it came up more than once uh, in the course of his podcast, um, which is just the Jason Stapleton show. If you want to check it out, but it's not the same show as it was it's when not, I would yeah, it's not have recommended it. It's not the. I mean, like they've completely changed focus. But um, anyway, uh, you know, he's a U.S. Marine Corps Force Force Recon. Yeah. Like, um, and. Uh, and after he came back from the service, he worked for a little while as a prison guard. Okay. I don't know if you remember him talking about I, that. Vaguely, yeah. And uh, one of the things that he said he learned during the course of his work as a prison guard is that you never, you always give them an out. Yeah. Like, they need an escape route. Like, never make somebody feel trapped because that's when violence happens. Yeah. Right? And that's what happened here. Um, the yeah. The guys... The, the perpetrators felt trapped and they just started firing. They were, they were stuck. There were police all around and they just started firing. Yeah. Um, now, we'll come back to the whole let's use the civilians as human shields thing. But um, it, it shouldn't have even come to that point because you've got, a, you've got a UPS truck. As I understand it, all UPS trucks have GPS uh, location, location service. Yeah. Um, so they could find this truck at any time. Besides, yeah. it's a... Giant UPS truck. Like, all you need is one helicopter. Well, I was going to say, and there were multiple helicopters on the scene. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, even one... Um, so, apparently, there were multiple helicopters, like, I guess, like, TV camera, TV station helicopters. And one of the one of those, at least, broadcast the whole thing live mm -hmm. on live TV. Yeah, so that's a video I saw. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like... They didn't have a. I mean, the police, like you say. I mean, I, I'm assuming where you're going is they could have backed off and let this truck kind of go some. Yeah. And and wait until it was in a place where, it, where they there was could, less going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that would make a lot of sense because instead of this, the middle of a busy intersection. I was going to say basically they got they, they yeah they were in rush hour traffic was my understanding mm -hmm. yeah so. Um. So the you know the point there is you just let them you're not going to lose them yeah. Um, yeah. and the, the reason to have a hostage, right, is to yeah. keep the police from taking you down. Yeah. Um, and, in you know, meanwhile here, they've got a dozen police cars following them until they come to a place where they can't go any farther. Yeah. And, you know, my question is then to the police, what did you expect would happen then? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what was the logical outcome here? You know? And the, you know, the crazy thing though, is that I saw uh, in the video, that once the car came or the truck came to a stop, um, all you know the police cars pull in behind. They all stop, get out of their cars, and they start moving up both sides. They're like surrounding the vehicle, nice. but with civilian cars between them and the UPS truck. Yeah, intentionally, like That's, moving yeah. using the the civilian cars as cover. Yeah. They're not trying to save people. They're not trying to keep people safe. They're not trying to, you know, protect anybody there and, except themselves. And that's what got me is is it seems to me in that situation what they should have been doing was evacuating people, was getting people out of the area. I yeah. mean I mean and that's what I would expect if I was in that as a civilian in that situation. And I see cops everywhere, like, do I need to like are they after me for one? Because <laughs> that's just where my mind goes. And if they're not 
maybe I need to be getting out of here and maybe they should be kind of telling me to get out of here, you know, yeah. but that didn't really seem like that was the case at all. It was just kind of <laughs> human shields, like you say. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I was, when I was watching it I was like, are they, are they using, you know, that guy's car as cover? Yeah. Like <laughs> with him in it, with him in it. Well, and, <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's as simple as open this car door and tell the guy to go. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you can get behind a wheel well or whatever. I yeah. Mean, you know, well, yeah, at least exactly. Try and get him somewhere where he's got some real cover. Yeah. Get, um, e- evacuate the civilians. And then when they start firing, they're firing from all sides. Bullets flying everywhere. They yeah. create a crossfire in the middle of a rush hour, busy interstate. Yeah. Which, like I say, I'm amazed that more people weren't hit I than, am too. than what were. Um, so, I, I, it just it makes you wonder where's the accountability at? Because what'll end up happening here is you'll end up with an investigation, and I mean, will anything really change because of it? Not likely. And that's what bothers me is that you can have something like this. I mean, it's barely. I mean, I have seen it on some mainstream media, but it's. Not to the, I mean, the outrage level just doesn't seem to be where I would think it should be. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. Remember, this is this is one set of jewelry store robbers. Yeah. Like one pair of jewelry store robbers that um, took a hostage because the police had already intervened, by the way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and like we were saying, I think it was last episode, those uh, protests that have become increasingly violent with uh, protesters throwing Molotov cocktails in Hong Kong Yeah, have not resulted in any civilian deaths caused by the police. Yeah. And then we have a, a, a simple jewelry heist, which I mean, granted I'm not condoning, but I no, mean, no. ends, ends in the way this did. I just, I don't know with the potential to have been so much worse. I mean, they're, they're extremely lucky. It wasn't a lot worse than it was. Yeah, I agree. So. Well, and that wasn't the only shooting in Florida last week. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, one was a little closer to our home, uh, not too far away at the Pensacola Naval Air Station. Yeah, um, been there dozens of times, countless times, actually. Yeah, so that was December 6th, which was what, last last Friday, right? Yeah. Like a week ago today? Um, anyway, uh, so what happened in this case is that a Saudi Air Force officer, um, something Mohammed Al Shamrani, um, he was here for training in uh, in U.S. made high performance jet fighters. Nice. Um, he opened fire in a classroom on the base, killed three, wounded eight um, before he was shot dead by the police. Of the eighty wounded, by the way, two of them were responding police officers. Yeah. Um, there were six total Saudis detained, as I understand it, after the shooting, uh, three of whom actually filmed the shooting occur. Wow. Like, um, I that... think uh, two from a car and one, you know, standing somewhere. I don't, I don't recall exactly the details of that. But yeah. um, while the guy acted alone, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't Looks seem like he to had been... he had sympathizers. Yeah, there yeah. you go. There you go. <laughs> And uh, you had said something to me about um, that they watched a bunch of shooting events or something a I few saw, days before. I saw something where they, um, a report or something that had said that, that they had had like a party or something and basically just like sat down on YouTube like mass shooter event stuff yeah. and just like watch stuff. See, and I read it as uh, he had a dinner party with friends. Oh, yeah. That's not what I heard. I heard that there was a party, but that was the activity at yeah. the party. Well, I kept looking after you told me that, and yeah. I found I found Did that you? information as well. Yeah. That, that was something that occurred at this dinner party. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the whole event is... It, it's being shrouded in secrecy. It's like, oh, well, we don't really know what happened or what it was all about. And, and that kind of irritates me because you're right. That's even even today. So, like, I was watching the news before I came over here today. And, and this, of course, happened in Pensacola. So it's on the news here every day right now. Yeah. And they're still saying the same thing, that they don't want to confirm what this is. And it's like, man, anybody looking at this objectively knows what it is. Well... Yes, uh, I, I think that you're right, and um, and actually the uh, shooter, as far as anybody knows anyway, on his yeah. Twitter account, um, was explicit about why 
he did this. Yeah. Uh, although that's been taken down since then. Of um, course. Luckily, the article that I posted on our Facebook page uh, that Scott Horton wrote included the text. Yeah. And so for those of you that don't follow the Facebook page or that looked at that really long article and said, I'm not reading this, um, <laughs> this is what he said on his Facebook page. And I'm going to read it as it was. So I'm okay. not trying to correct for grammar and so forth because there's some Because issues. there's some problems. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, I'm not against you for just being American. I don't hate you because your freedoms. I hate you because every day you supporting funding and committing crimes, not only against Muslims, but also humanity. I am against evil. And America as a whole has turned into a nation of evil. What I see from America is the supporting of Israel, which is invasion of Muslim country. I see invasion of many countries by its troops. I see Guantanamo Bay. I see cruise missiles, cluster bombs, and UAV. Your decision makers, the politicians, the lobbyists, and the major corporations are the ones gaining from your foreign policy, and you are the ones paying the price for it. What benefit is it to the American people to suffer for the sake of supporting Israel? Do you expect to transgress against others and yet be spared retribution? How many more body bags are American families willing to receive? For how long can the U.S. survive this war of attrition? The U.S. Treasury spends billions of dollars in order to give Americans a false sense of security. The security is shared destiny. You will not be safe until we live as reality in Palestine. I think he means Palestine there. Um, and American troops get out of our lands. Yeah. Now, this is essentially the same thing that terrorists have said. Like, Every time they yeah. commit acts of violence. like this is that, That's the same whole spill. Yeah, but what we're told by our government is that they hate our freedoms and how good we are. Yeah. No, what they hate is they have they hate having bombs being dropped on their families. Yeah. They hate us being in there telling them how to run their own countries. Um, you know, we talk about self self-governance here yeah. all the time. Like allowing these people self-determination would go a long way to putting an end to yeah. this kind of activity. Absolutely. Um, and you know, it wouldn't happen because I got in a debate with somebody about this the other day. It wouldn't happen overnight. Like if we just started pulling the troops home, but over time, if we started pulling the troops back, you'd see less and less of this stuff, at least in this country. Now that's not that they're going to fight over there till the end of time. Um, but but that's not really Probably. where our yeah that's not really where our focus should be though. Yeah, I mean I just I, I believe that I just do. Well, and you know, the, okay. So the Secretary of Defense, uh, Mark Esper, yeah, said he is quote considering several steps to ensure the security of our military installations and the safety of our service members and their families. Uh, but he didn't provide details, of course. Well, now, well, I would like for that to be like arming them. <laughs> well, yeah, that's actually something. I mean, I don't want to spend a whole long uh, time talking about that. That's because fine. I think that, that but was, it, But it does need to be brought up, I think. I mean, that's a focus. I think that that's a misdirected focus of what the story has been on this. But yeah. we'll come back to that in a second. Yeah. Um, now, my thought when I read that is if U.S. military bases in the United States are not secure, yeah, yeah, then where are we secure? No joke. Right? Like if the military bases here aren't secure from this, then how can you even make the claim that you're securing the country? Yeah. Um, well, and then that's true. There's also the whole thing about, uh, well, we have to fight them over there so we, we don't have, have to fight, fight them, them over, over here. here. Yeah. Right. That's, that's well, a... Um, Not a good argument. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think that that fallacy has been clearly exposed here. Yeah. Uh, the longer we fight them over there, the more we end up fighting them over here. Like yep. we're now we're creating them over here. And this was a Saudi guy. Um, yeah. Now he was over here on an essentially. It's not exactly an exchange program, but as our um, military industrial complex sells really expensive United States high performance jet fighters to uh, these foreign countries, part of the deal is that they'll provide training for their pilots here in the United States. Oh, okay. All right. So that's why he that. was here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know. Uh, well, there's a lot of talk about ending that program now. Like, yeah. So. Well, I mean, that's and not. I don't know that they will. But, they, they won't because it's yeah. too much money for too many big American com uh, companies. companies yeah. I mean, it's not like uh, like Lockheed Martin would lose a lot of sales if this wasn't part of the deal. Yeah. And and you don't want to upset <laughs> Lockheed Martin because then you'll get a lot less campaign yeah. financing next time well, around. I mean, that's the whole reason we're doing all this anyway is to prop up these military companies. As much as anything else, I think that you're probably right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's why he was here. And once again, this is a Saudi. 
just like most of the uh, pl- plane hijackers for 9-11. Yep. yep. Um, this is not a... a um, what is it? This is not a an enemy country over there. No, this is supposed to be our ally. Yeah, there, this right? is our big ally besides yeah. Israel, right? Israel and Saudi Arabia, those yep. are our big allies. Yet for some reason... This keeps happening. The Saudis keep attacking us here in the United States. Yeah. Um, and we kind of ignore it. Um, I guess yeah. because we're selling them billions of dollars worth of weapons so that we can have an, uh, an exchange program where their pilots can come over here and do terrorist attacks here. Yeah. Well, and we'll pay for their flight. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so there's, oh gosh, there's so many problems about this. And, and as far as the, uh, the gun thing, okay. Yeah. I guess it's worth mentioning because that is certainly the, the focus that people are taking with this, it, it has this been. story. Um, is that, uh, well, he legally purchased a gun here and he shouldn't have been able to do that and he brought it on base, which he shouldn't have been able to do um, right. because the only people that are supposed to have guns on base are security personnel. Yeah. Now, here's here's an interesting thought. Yeah. If that classroom had been full of military personnel with sidearms... Exactly. Um, it might have been a little harder for him to pull this off. Yeah, and I don't think he would have attempted it, honestly. No, I mean, if he's not. walking in those classrooms and, I mean, everybody in there is armed, this isn't exactly where I want to yeah. be doing Ar- this. Not only armed, but armed and trained. Yeah. It's all military well, guys. Yeah, well, and, and that's my that's always been my problem with that policy because I've heard this for a while. People tell me that, you know, that, that firearms are heavily restricted on bases, even for military folks mm-hmm. on, on bases here in the U.S., at least here in the States. And I've never I've never understood that. Here you are, you've got all of these guys that are heavily trained in firearms, and you're not letting them carry them. <laughs> I mean, it just, it, it seems like, I mean, I, you know, the odds are low that there's going to be an attack or something on a base here in the States, but clearly it happens, mm-hmm. you know. Well, and here... Uh, you're absolutely right, and I'm moving on. That's fine. <laughs> okay, um, because he, here's the issue that I see. The other issue about this is that uh, supporters of tighter gun laws have seized on this. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. as uh, another example of why we need more gun restrictions. Oh yeah, I've been in a few debates about that this week too. Well, and here here's what I would say to them: that you're focusing on the wrong problem. Exactly. You, you're diverting the problem from being a foreign policy issue to a domestic policy issue, and it's not the domestic policy that's the problem here. Yep. The problem here is the foreign policy. Exactly. And from there, <laughs> we can go into our last topic, which is a big one, um, which is the uh, the Washington Post publishing um, their story on the Afghanistan papers and making you know something like two thousand pages of transcripts and stuff available nice. um, publicly. Uh, now it's it's mostly interviews. Um, they're a byproduct of a project led by the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghan Afghanistan Reconstruction, hmm. known as uh, Sigar Cigar. I'm going to say Cigar because that We're seems say like for the podcast purposes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was uh, created by Congress in 2008 to investigate waste and fraud in the war zone. Um, they did this particular project, uh, which, by the way, cost 11 million dollars by itself. Oh, wow. um, and uh, it's titled Lessons Learned. Um, it was meant to diagnose the policy failures in Afghanistan so the United States would not repeat the mistakes next time it invaded a country <laughs> or tried to rebuild a shattered one. Yeah. So first off, how do you feel about the underlying assumption there that, well, you know, next time we invade yeah. a country. Well, um, this is attempt one. On attempt two, we're going to get it better. Yeah, yeah. We'll get it right next time. Yeah, there you uh, go. They're using our mother. <laughs> um, and so they interviewed more than 600 people with firsthand experience in the war. Um, the they've the Post has had this information been trying to publish it for years now. Oh, really? Um, and they finally won uh, the release of the documents under a FOIA um, case. Uh, like I said, they've been fighting over it for like three years. Hmm. Um and then, so now this is available to us. Now, of course, I haven't read all this. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, I haven't lot dug, of I heard that this was out there, but I haven't really sunk my teeth into this much at all. Well, I've read a bunch of articles about it. Nobody's read the whole thing at this point, except maybe people at the Washington Post that have maybe, had it for three years. Well, them and maybe Scott Horton. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, he doesn't sleep. It's a possibility. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to cover some things that have come up. Yeah. Um, as I've been reading through uh, other people commenting on this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, the Washington Post article was like 
Well, there actually there were separate articles, but stitched together, it's like thirty pages. Yeah. Um, and it was it was an interesting read, and they have links to the documents uh, in all the to places where you, they cite. Show them. you yeah. where where it was at in the document. Absolutely. Cool. And so um, here's just a few a few bits from it now, and none of this should be new information to anybody listening to this podcast. Yeah. Uh, because this is what we've been saying since we started this podcast. Yeah. Um, that this was not going well. That this was a waste of time and money that we just needed to get out. Yeah. And we've only been doing this podcast for a year. Uh, you know, Scott Horton, as an example, wrote an entire book about this years ago. <laughs> yes, he did. Right. Yes, he did. Um, there's been a lot of people that have been calling. That, that have been saying this. And yeah. actually, I think that Scott summed up the these um, this release uh, as well as anybody, or better than most, yeah. certainly. Um, I, I heard him in an interview. He was interviewing somebody else, and something about these Afghanistan papers came up. And he said, uh, you know, what they show is that um, the critics of the war have been right the whole time. Yeah. That the government knew it the whole time. And that they've been lying to the public the, the whole, whole time. time. Yeah, that, that makes nothing but sense. So, here we go. Um, Douglas Lute, uh, he's a three-star Army general and served at the White as the White House's uh, Afghan war czar during the Bush and Obama administrations. Um, he, he said, uh, what are we trying to do here? We didn't have the foggiest notion of what we were undertaking in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, some U.S. officials wanted to use the war to turn Afghanistan into a democracy. Well, good luck with that. I mean, that we've talked before. About how this doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was 600 years of history and cultural change that led to our republic here in the United States. That It's yeah. not. You can't just install this. Yeah, you somewhere. can't make it happen. Um, others wanted to transform Afghan culture and elevate women's rights. Same kind of thing. Uh, still others wanted to reshape the regional balance of power among Pakistan, India, Iran, and Russia. Now, <laughs> why, so my question there was, is it any of our place to try and rebalance power in the Middle East, you know, someplace yeah. halfway around the world from us? Well, that, and, and that's, that's probably the most honest answer, though. I mean, that's pro more than likely that's what the true agenda is. Well, but not they that were that saying makes, some not people that wanted that makes this. It okay. you know. Yeah, some people wanted this, some people wanted that. I mean, I'm yeah. sure that there were people that wanted to bring... Well, I know that there were people that wanted to bring democracy to Afghanistan. Well, yeah, that was... Um, I'm sure that there were people that wanted to, uh, you know, bring the culture up and have women's rights and, and more general freedom freedoms that kind of fits in with the democracy yeah. thing right and that's and there's nothing wrong with that but i suspect that most of them wanted to rebalance power and determine who was going to be in control over there exactly uh, mostly us yeah. and i also thought well you know how are we how did we intend to do that by killing a bunch of farmers halfway around the world <laughs> yeah. um they uh they you know went on to say um was al-qaeda the enemy or the taliban was pakistan a friend or an adversary um, what about the Islamic State and the bewildering array of foreign jihadists, let alone the warlords on the CIA's payroll? Um, the U.S. government never settled on an answer, and in the field, the U.S. troops often couldn't tell friend from foe. Yeah. I mean, that's... And I've talked to people that's been over there that's told me that. Yeah. That, you know, I mean, they don't know who the enemy is. Like, I mean, they, they don't. Do you, um, by any chance, ever watch the documentary Combat Obscura? I haven't. No. Okay. It's like, uh, it's available on uh, iTunes. Okay. Well, that's where I got it. I, I got it on iTunes. It's not very expensive. Um, it's about an hour. And uh, the story there is that um, it, is, uh, it was filmed by the U.S. Marine Corps. Yeah. Um, they took, they brought a camera, or they they had a U.S. Marine Corps camera crew out there uh, to gather footage in Afghanistan yeah. um, for, you know, some kind of, reporter documentary or who who knows what they were using it for i don't remember <laughs> yeah. um well so the these guys the um they went out there and they got the footage that was requested of them and they kept filming because <laughs> they had the had the stuff to do it right yeah. yeah um and so they put together this documentary and I, I can't say that it's it doesn't editorialize because just by choosing what footage you're going to put in there you're editorializing you're, yeah. to some degree but there's no commentary over it Oh, it's really? it's raw footage. It's just watching what was going on. Yeah, I mean, and some of it's interviews with with soldiers out there in the field and and things like that too. But yeah, um, it was like I don't know. There were some scenes that were really striking. I suggest that that people go watch it. But that was something that was that was readily apparent. Is yeah. that 
they just kind of treated everybody like an enemy. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and you can, and that's not a good way of of promoting. You know, any it, it doesn't yeah. make your job easier in the well, long run. And and that's but to do a, to to fight a war like this, you kind of have to do that. And it would be no different if the Chinese came over here mm-hmm. and started calling or taking over this country. Yeah. They would treat everybody in this country like the enemy because we would all because they there's no way for them to know who is and who isn't. Right. Because when you it's that type of warfare, mm-hmm. that's just how it's fought. Yeah. No. And I'm not saying that I don't understand why it was that yeah. way. No, I know. I'm I, just I, saying. I understand why, but it's it, counterproductive. But it doesn't work. Is yeah. the point. Um. And you know. The, of course, my answer is we shouldn't be there at all. Well, like, yeah. There's no reason for us to be there in the first place. And, you know, to that point, um, we had, twenty, uh, well, almost 2,400 um, U.S. soldiers die yeah. uh, in the Afghanistan war. Um, there were more than 20,000 uh, casualties in terms of, uh, you know, wounded in action. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, and that's Defense Department figures. Um, there's been more than 150,000 total deaths yeah. in Afghanistan. That's um, Afghan government forces, uh, Taliban and other jihadi forces, um, U.S. forces, allied forces, etc. Really? More than 150,000. And I imagine that the number is actually much bigger than that. It has to be. Um, because this is, this is what they're calling uh, casualties uh, yeah. of the war. This is people that were actually killed by um, you know some kind of weaponry. It doesn't include all the people that have died... Um, from starvation or just general lack of having what they need to survive. Yeah. Um, it doesn't uh, include, actually, and the truth is that we know also from these papers that they were manipulating information. We've known for a long time that they were um, suppressing uh, the number of casualties that they were reporting. Yeah. Um, and while something like 60,000 or 40 to 60,000 of these reported casualties were civilians, um, it, we also have the reports that they were counting anybody that was in these particular war zones. Like we were talking about with the Vietnam thing yeah. um, from the Pentagon Papers, yeah. um, or actually it was from the, the general's autobiography later on, but um, where they were classifying entire areas as anybody that that's killed here as a militant. <laughs> yeah. uh, you yeah. know, even if they're three years old, they're a militant. Exactly. Um, we're doing the same thing in Afghanistan, and we were just like purposely misreporting numbers of deaths. Yeah. Of civilians to try and not create the kind of outrage. Yeah. Luckily for them, it's halfway around the world and it's not really affecting Americans for the most part. And so Americans generally don't care. They just don't bother. Yeah. Um, but either way, I mean, there's 150,000 reported deaths. It's probably a lot more than that. Yeah. I mean, and I've even heard figures, uh, you know, approaching half a million. Yeah. Um, and so, and this also includes around 3,500 U.S. contractors over there. Yeah. Um, so we've had about 6,000 American deaths uh, yeah. in Afghanistan. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, uh, it, it, the documents um, also, they contradict a long course of public statements. Some of this is, I'm quoting from the article, um, from U.S. presidents, military commanders, and diplomats who assured Americans year after year that they were making progress in Afghanistan and the war was worth fighting. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, some examples there. Suicide bombings in Kabul were portrayed as a sign of the Taliban's desperation. Uh, the insurgents were too weak to engage in direct combat. Um, rising U.S. troop deaths was cited as proof the American forces were taking the fight to the enemy. Um <laughs> And uh, Bob Crowley, who is an army colonel who served as the senior counterinsurgency advisor to U.S. military commanders in 2013 and 2014. I don't know how they fit these titles on on, (laughs) On um, business cards, you know. Um, He says, uh, every data point was altered to present the best picture possible. Yeah. And uh, and another senior NSC official said, uh, and this went on for and on and on for two reasons: um, to make everyone involved look good, and to make it look like the troops and resources were having the kind of effect where removing them would cause the country to deteriorate. Yeah, we got to keep this going. Exactly. Um, I mean, it, it's the cost has been outrageous as well. Um, the United States allocated more than $133 billion to build up Afghanistan. Now, the war itself has cost us about a trillion, yeah. more than a trillion. Yeah. Um, not way more than – actually, probably if you, once you start 
figuring in everything you know va costs and stuff like that yeah. you know the the down the road costs it's probably oh yeah really significantly higher than a trillion but about a trillion dollars um has been spent on the war so far and they spent 133 billion to build up afghanistan um, and that's, by the way, more than it's spent uh, adjusted for inflation to revive the whole of Western Europe with the Marshall Plan after World War II. Wow. All right. Um, of course, inflation numbers are off as well because we pretend because that, that the was... dollar hasn't devalued to the level that it has. But that's a discussion for an economic podcast. <laughs> yeah. We're doing a foreign policy podcast right now. Yeah. Um, so one unidentified contractor told the government interviewers he was expected to dole out $3 million daily for projects in a single Afghan district, roughly the size of a U.S. county. He once asked a visiting congressman whether the lawmaker could responsibly spend that kind of money back home. He said, hell no. <laughs> well, sir, that's what you just obligated us to spend, and I'm doing it for communities that live in mud huts with no windows. Um, they said the Afghan security forces were incompetent. This was also a big part of the spending, obviously, to try yeah. and build up the Afghan security forces. Yeah. Um, they're incompetent, unmotivated, rife with deserters. Um, they also uh, accused Afghan commanders of pocketing salaries. Um, and for tens of thousands of ghost soldiers, like names that they put on the books that weren't actually there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and this NSC official said, we lost objectivity. We were given money, told to spend it, and we did, without reason. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as far as these ghost soldiers and, and things like that, just remember that this trillion dollars and $133 billion to to build up Afghanistan, $3 million a day in tiny little places with mud huts and so forth, um, we're paying for all of that. Oh, yeah. That's our money. Yeah. yeah. That's taxpayer money all the way. Um hmm. And, you know, as far as the incompetent Afghan security forces, uh, you see it in Scott Horton's book. They're talking about how there's this is unsustainable. The losses to the Afghan security forces are unsustainable. There's no way that they can maintain their own security without U.S. involvement, yeah. um, even with all the money that we're pumping in there. I mean, there's a bunch of stories of that a lot of these guys are getting in there. Um, they're getting their first paycheck, their rifle, and then they're going and fighting for the Taliban. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just it just goes on and on. Like or turning this. or turning their rifle on U.S. soldiers, like there. I mean, yeah. that's happened. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, I mean, the whole thing is a complete mess. Has been from the beginning, and they've known it from the beginning. Yeah. But there's this giant complex of people that are making a lot of money on this, and you know, uh, there aren't enough Americans that care. Yeah. And what I want to hammer home is because hopefully then you'll start caring is that, you know, they've spent a trillion dollars in Afghanistan. The terror war as a whole is, has spent somewhere between six and eight trillion in the last 20 years. And that's all your money. Yep. Exactly. All your money. This is a way of, uh, you know, re it, it's similar to the foreign aid article that I that I wrote that was published at the Libertarian Institute. And, and I've talked about this kind of thing, although it was specifically about military aid to countries. Yeah. But it's the same kind of thing with a war as well, that it, this is a way of extracting money from the taxpayers and then privatizing it into these big military contractors. Yeah. They're taking your money and they're giving it to Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and General Dynamics and all of these companies. Yeah, and then they're giving it to PBS. Well, and they're giving it they're giving it to PBS so they get favorable coverage. Yep. And they're giving it to your politician to go back into office so that he yeah. can run his campaign and get back into the office. This is it's this yeah. big loop where they take money from you, they give it to somebody else who gives it back to them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Everybody Crazy. makes out except for the taxpayer. Yeah, exactly. Except for the person whose money it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, and presumably the people that are actually fighting over there. Well, they're yeah. not making out that well, well no, either. No, they're not doing good either. Although they're getting your money too, but not nearly as much of it. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> so um, the the Washington Post article, and I'm not a big fan of the Washington Post these days, by the way. Yeah. Um, but this was good. I, you know, yeah. I, I think it could have... I think they could have really driven the point home a little bit better. They, I think they were still kind of fighting with kid gloves with the information that they had. Yeah. Um, but all the same, uh, they closed with uh, with this statement. I'm just going to quote the whole thing because I thought it was good. Um, <clears throat> I do not. Uh, I do think the key benchmark is the one I've suggested, which is how many Afghans are getting killed. James Dobbin, the former U.S. diplomat, told a Senate panel in 2009. If the number's going up, you're losing. If the number's going down, you're winning. It's as simple as that. Last year, 
3,804 Afghan civilians were killed in the war, according to the United Nations. That is the most in one year since the United Nations began tracking casualties a decade ago. Wow. So, we're losing. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way to get out of Afghanistan is to leave. Is to leave. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we were this close. Yeah. Well, they're talking again. Are they? Yeah. Oh, really? Um, they, they've restarted negotiations with the that. Taliban. Okay. Um, there's some kind of... They put a hold on it right now, but it's supposed to be temporary because of some suicide bombing in Kabul. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, was it in Kabul? It was by a military base. So yeah. um, Anyway, but as far as I know, they haven't called off the talks again. Yeah. Um, and they are talking again. Well, hey, that's something. Yeah. And so but the, the point that I was going to make also here is that like we have all this information now. Yeah. About how this is going badly, that they're lying to us about it, and yeah. that just keeps they just keep wasting our money, yeah. wasting our money to privatize tax money with these companies that make a living off of war, yeah, um, and chaos and what have you. And and in the midst of all of this, um, they have the Congress has signed the uh, 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA. Okay. Um, that gives uh, seven hundred and thirty-eight billion dollars to Department of Defense. Really, seven hundred and thirty-eight billion dollars. That's a thirty billion dollar increase over last year. It's three quarters of a trillion dollars just to the Department of Defense. Remember, the total budget is just over four trillion dollars, right? Yeah. Which is still more than we take in. Oh yeah. But you know, essentially twenty percent of the total budget goes just to the Department of Defense, and that's not all the war stuff. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Um, and here's what's more in all of that, in this corrupt, you know, defense thing that we have going on here in this country, um, is that there were there were a bunch of good clauses that were in the original write ups of these bills. Yeah. But what was signed? Um, they had a, a prohibition of military support for the Saudi war in Yemen. Okay. It was removed. Really. No, no more prohibition for support of the Saudi war in Yemen. President can do that all he wants. Keep selling them weapons. In fact, keep selling them air-to-ground munitions, um, yeah. which is one of the things that had been originally prohibited in the NDAA. Yeah. But now we've essentially said the president can feel free to keep selling the Saudis' weapons that they're going to use to blow up farms and irrigation canals and people on the ground wow. to maintain this genocidal war in Yemen, where they have actively tried to to take away the absolute necessities of life, food, water, uh, sanitation, etc. And they can continue to do so now. Huh. Um, there was a, originally a, um, a requirement that Congress reconsider the 2001 and 2002 um, AUMFs. That's the Authorization for Use of Military Force. Yeah. Um, these were the things that, that were written up after the 9-11 attacks to give authorization to the U.S. government to um, prosecute a war. Uh, the war on terror. Yeah. Um, now, this was originally uh, chasing down the people directly responsible for 9-11 and uh, going into Iraq. They yeah. added the 2002 ones to justify going into Iraq. Yeah. Now, these same two things are still in effect now and have been used to justify these wars all over the North Africa yeah. and the Middle East, uh, into for, Central for, Asia, essentially, at yeah. this point. For, Pakistan, Afghanistan. So um, 20 years we've been on the same... Yeah, yeah, Syria, Yemen, um, Iraq. Uh, they're trying to talk about Iran in it, even though that was completely, you know, yeah. they've been our allies in the first part of this war. Um, <laughs> Niger, Mali, Somalia, uh, mm. Libya, all of these things, they've been, used these two AUMFs. And there was originally a requirement that they reconsider them and probably rewrite them. Now, yeah. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Because at some point they do rewrite them, and they yeah. rewrite them to give them Worse. more authority. Yeah, they don't. They don't rewrite them in our favor. Yeah. <laughs> um, but either way, that was removed. Wow. Um, before they signed the bill, uh, there was a, a requirement for congressional approval before um, the U.S. could enter a war with Iran. Yeah. Now, why you have to put that in the NDAA, <laughs> I have no idea, because it's in the Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. It's supposed to be. Right? Mm -hmm. So, why you have to specify that in an act yeah. um, where it's already specified in the Constitution, I don't know. 
But either way, they took it out. Wow. Um, and what that's going to be taken by the the executive branch is that they're free to that now we can do to this. begin a war in Iran yeah. if they choose yeah. um, without congressional approval because there we don't do congressional approval anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, finally, um, there was also a, originally a prohibition on research and use of low yield nuclear weapons. That's the tactical nuclear weapons that you hear about. Yeah. You know, not the big giant city killer H bombs that that we have, um, but just like just little nuclear weapons <laughs> um, that you can use very precisely. No, no yeah. nuclear weapon is precise. Yeah, right. This kind of defeats the purpose, right? Yeah, and so that prohibition was removed, um, and that's. That might be the most dangerous thing. We may need to spend more time talking about nuclear war on this podcast because I don't think people are scared enough. Yeah. You know, we've talked about it some, but it mm-hmm. probably wouldn't hurt to, to dive deep into some of that. Yeah. Everybody go back and listen to Dan Carlin's hardcore history uh, called The Destroyer of Worlds. Um, it's available for free on iTunes. You, you can do it on YouTube. It's long. Yeah. Um, it it's like six hours. Uh, I find it fascinating yeah (laughs) um first off i think that he does what he has done a really good job of is giving you that feeling of like you're there of distress of that there's always like at any moment could be your last well Um, he does he does do a good job with that but he also does a good job of making it like i felt like i was in those times he was describing Mm -hmm. like when he was talking about with truman and and in the time after all of that like, I just really kind of felt like I was, like, you're there, you know? Like, you're living in those times, and this is what they were, the world was like then, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I it's right it, there on the knife's edge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, th- this is, might be the most dangerous provision that they removed, um, mm-hmm. because the idea is that there, it's like this controlled escalation. Yeah. Um, that, well, you know, we can use a low-yield nuclear weapon to... Show that country, show Russia that we mean business. <laughs> you think that they're just going to not respond to and, that? Yeah, and they're not going to respond with a nuclear weapon, of course. Because, yeah, why would they do that? Yeah. Like, it's not like they don't have a ton of them. <laughs> and you know, I and I'm you've not, already gave them a reason to do it. Like, exactly. Uh, it and makes, I, I don't. I know that this sounds a lot of times on this podcast like I'm a blame America first person, and right. I'm not. I, or I don't yeah. consider myself a blame America first person. That might. <laughs> that might be how it comes out. Maybe yeah. I am, and I just don't realize it yet. Maybe I'm a well, denier. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I'll, I'll tell you, I, I'm not the first to want to blame America first. It just seems like we're always freaking to blame. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, you know. Well, and the point that I was going to make, you know, there yeah. is that um, if you'll remember that while we're talking about how all these countries may use nuclear weapons, and so we have to maintain you know, more than 10,000 nuclear weapons, which, uh, you know, could destroy the entire Earth five times over or something. Um, That, you know, while we're talking about how we have to be worried about everybody else in the world and their access to nuclear weapons, the only country that has ever used a nuclear weapon against another country is the United States. Yeah. You know, it's true. (laughs) So while we're out there fear-mongering about other countries... Yeah. Without any real reason. We've done it. Yeah. Other countries have absolute reason to fear the United States because we've done it before. Yeah. There you go. And on that promising note. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I guess we're going to call this one. Unless you got something more you want to throw in there. No, I think we about summed everything up. Yeah. And fascinating stuff with Afghanistan. Like I said, I haven't read much into it yet. So Mm -hmm. I'm kind of excited to dig my teeth in some. Yeah, I have been reading on that since that information came out. Yeah. Like uh, pretty much all my free time has gone to (laughs) reading about this. Um, And then I I watched a little bit of Netflix too. But mostly (laughs) mostly reading about (laughs) Afghanistan papers. Um, So, uh, and I was thinking... Like so, there was a lot in the news this week that we haven't gotten to address at all. Yeah. Um. There's uh. You know. Of course. There's the whole IG report. Yeah. Um. That's probably important. Yeah. Uh, I've definitely. read a little bit about that uh, bit when about. I wasn't reading about the Afghanistan papers. That you yeah. Know, that was right there Stuck front your head and center. In there, yeah. Um. And so that's probably so. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say now a couple of topics that we're probably gonna talk about next episode. All right. Hopefully that'll entice people and say, yeah, yeah I would like to see what they have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. So one of those things is 
has got to be the IG report. Yeah, we need point. to dig into that. Um, and the other one I think is this uh, um, executive order that Trump just signed about uh, anti-Semitism. Well, really? um, yeah, I, I think that that's an important point because they're using some outside definitions of anti-Semitism that include um, things that are really just criticisms of the Israeli government. Yeah. Ah, oh, really? Uh, yeah. That's an interesting way to interpret. Um, I hmm. I think it's obvious if you look at it, but we'll we'll talk about <laughs> we it. We should we should um, get into that. <laughs> so uh, those at least those topics probably, unless something really crazy happens, which who yeah. knows? Uh, um, I mean, well, we know impeachment will start or will be official, I guess, by next week. Yeah, but that's barely a story. It, you wouldn't <laughs> think so listening to the media, man. Well, like, I know, that's I know. all they talk about. It's crazy, man. And and no, everybody knows where it's going to end. Is what's so crazy. Yeah. Like even when they're reporting it on it, it's everybody knows, but. But they still talk on the, about it on the end. Yeah. Well, that's the important story is how, you know, Trump, whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he did bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Orange man bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's been the story uh, since November of 2016, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. so we'll we'll maybe hit impeachment stuff. Uh, I doubt if, that. If, if, there's, just, if something... Interesting happens with it. I mean, if yeah. it, if it plays the the if it plays out the way it looks like it will, there's mm-hmm. not much to talk about. But IG report important and interesting no, stuff. There's there's stuff there. We definitely got to dig into that one. Yeah, and the anti-Semitism thing I think is important too because yeah. it really starts to infringe on some really basic rights. Yeah. Um. So, uh, all this and more. <laughs> on the next episode <laughs> on the next episode of the liberty mic when we finally get this right in the meantime um you know follow us on facebook uh share and like and subscribe on itunes and share and like there um you know positive reviews are great and uh we have a website oh i did have an article posted at the libertarian institute this oh, week that's right. um what was it called Oh, uh, government intrusion laid bare. If you found something interesting in our podcast a couple of weeks ago um, about the um, public nudity and all that stuff, um, I wrote a whole article about it, (laughs) and uh, and I enjoyed writing it. And they they put it up at the Libertarian Institute, where they've been very gracious in accepting pretty much everything that I've sent to them. Actually, everything that I've sent to them. Yeah. Um, it's because everything you put together has been good. When you finish articles, they're good, man. I, yeah, well, that's the hard part. Finishing an article is the hard part. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, again, in keep following and liking and doing positive things for us and helping us spread the messages. And, Absolutely. And, uh, Got to fight the good fight. Yep. And, uh, and so until next time, ciao. Later.